it's nice to be here today to tell you a little bit about our certification program with the Society for Ecological Restoration. Just a little overview of what I'm going to go over today. So I'll talk about the you know, benefits, certification, why it's helpful to individuals, organizations, and the wider global community. A little bit of background on uh, SCR principles and standards, and talk about some of the opportunities and challenges um, to developing and expanding the certification program. I'll also go over the uh, application process for those of you who are interested in applying, and I encourage people to look at that and apply if you're interested. Uh, and then I have some examples from people who have gone through the certification. All right. So first, just a little background on Society for Ecological Restoration for those not familiar with it. So it was founded, founded in 1988 in Wisconsin in the Northern US. Purpose is to advance the science practice and policy of eco ecological restoration around the globe. And it has expanded to be a really global organization. There's people, members and uh, board members people involved with the organization at all levels from all around the world. The uh, certified uh, certification program, you call it CERP for Certified Ecological Restoration Practitioner, uh, that started in 2017. And that's one of the um, practice programs. You can see here there's uh, certification, also delivery of conferences, webinars, workshops, and we have continuing education credits that go along with the certification for people to maintain their certification over time. And re related to the practice, we also have this International uh, Principles and Standards for Ecological Restoration that was uh, this revised uh, in 2019. And that provides you know, a framework for describing you know, what quality ecological restoration projects are um, and kind of a uniform way of um, assessing some of them around the world. All right. So first of all, let's talk about the why a little bit. What are some of the benefits of certification? Well, so first off, uh, yeah, there's just, a, I mean, a tremendous need to have people trained in the ability to do good restoration work to address global land degradation, or climate change issues. You know, there's a growing kind of connection between restoration work and addressing climate change, things like reforestation and other ways to store sequester carbon, you know, through land management. And also just preventing loss of healthy functioning ecosystems. So, uh, you know, providing people that are, are trained and uh, able to do good work is a critical part of that. So, you know, we, we feel that the, the certification will help to improve the outcomes on the ground of restoration projects by you know, uh, promoting these standards, certifying that people are, have the experience and education and are able to you know, implement the projects in a way that follow those standards leads to better outcomes. And then, you know, it, uh, the certification also helps to uh, advance the uh, profession um, and help it to grow uh, in a number of ways, you know, I end up spending a lot of my time talking to younger pe people who are early professionals or students. Um, and so it gives them a way to sort of um, get an edge by getting certification on their CV, but also just connecting to uh, a network of people who have the certification. You know, other professions have these things uh, that restoration hasn't had. So you have like with engineers, you know, societies of civil engineers and things like that. Um, which help them people in those groups in a variety of ways and also help to promote standards. Um, restoration is obviously a newer field that's only been around for a few years, the certification, but it helps to serve a lot of those same kind of purposes and allows also restorationists to um, sort of compete with other professions uh, like landscape architects and engineers in a sense to, um, you know, get some of this work, uh, restoration project work. There we go. Okay, so right now we, we have two types of certification. There's a certified ecological restoration practitioner for more senior level practitioners. 
now we have the SERP in training for people that have the education but haven't had five years of you know, full-time work experience yet. And we have a lot of, of, of both of these. Um, there's over 500 total now. Most are in the SERP category, but there's probably um, of the SERPITs, maybe a, a third of the total are the SERPITs. <clears throat> A while back, we had a, a survey of some of the people involved in the program and asked them why they why they got certified. And so these are some of the answers just kind of listed in their words here. Uh, obviously, to help get a job or increase their salary, uh, the credentials can help on proposals. So if you're you know applying for a competitive proposal, uh, having those credentials can give you a leg up on others. And just being you know, respected, valued, increasing stature, being seen as more of an expert, all those things are important. Um, I think, you know, especially in consulting world, perhaps more because uh, they're not connected to sort of established institutions that are funding the restoration work themselves, but have to compete for the restoration projects. But we have people in all the sectors, nonprofit, government, academics, private, all right, so you can see there's a variety of people or reasons why people are, are joining and signing up to do it. <laughs> um, and part of it is that um, when you go through the certification, you, you learn about these uh, standards and principles of restoration that uh, the society has developed you know, and worked on over uh, many years. Um, so by going through the certification process, you have to describe how some of your projects meet these um, you know, follow the principles and standards. This is a picture of a project that I worked on in uh, southern Minnesota, a stream restoration project a number of years ago on the right there, where we went through the whole kind of life cycle of um, steps needed to, you know, do a good restoration project from planning and design, implementing, monitoring, and follow up. And also, I'll show a brief kind of overview of some of those standards and principles after I. Let's go through these benefits parts first here. All right, and hopefully this will improve the long-term success of, of work by looking at, you know, looking at these projects from the bigger picture, not just kind of slapping them down in the ground, but, you know, planning them in the long-term, seeing they're connected to the landscape, thinking about monitoring, following up, and communicating the results after they're done. You know, all those things are part of um, the standards. <clears throat> Yeah, so as mentioned there in the previous slide, there's benefits to the individuals through um, recognition and status. Um, it also connects you to a continuing education network. So it gives you um, opportunities, or at least it makes it easier to access those opportunities, things like webinars and workshops. SCR has a lot of webinars now. Um, Alexis Gibson is our um, education coordinator and she has been posting uh, webinars every week now. We have them every week on SCR. And a lot of the SERPs use those for their continuing education credits. So it makes it easier to continue your education. Um, all right, and in some cases it can help you on RFPs, which is a request for proposals. Um, all right. And, you know, especially with uh, students, it can help you get or people with uh, less experience getting their credentials can help you get the leg up. This is supposed to be a kind of race, race to the top for the, competing for these jobs. So it can help, help you just compete. And um, a lot of the ecological restoration jobs are, are, are very competitive because a lot of people who want to do it, uh, and especially when you're earlier in your career, you need all the help you can get uh, in terms of credentials, experience and things. And so it, it does help, it has helped a number of people. And that also provides um, kind of a, you know, a conduit for people to become the, the whole SERP. A lot of the younger um, people are in the SERP pits and then it allows you to more easily become a SERP over time once you get the, the five years full-time restoration experience. <clears throat> uh, so, and so, you know, aside from the individuals, it's increasingly being recognized by organizations. So there'll be uh, organizations trying to fund restoration projects that um, they're asking for people with credentials. And of course, SERP is you know, one of, of, of many. I mean, there's certification for landscape architects and engineers, but on specific types, you know, specific 
restoration projects, um, people are recognizing the value of that. <clears throat> and it is sort of um, provides an external, you know, validation of your experience and expertise. So you're not just claiming that on your resume that you're great and have all this experience, but, you know, a committee of people from SER is certified that you have that experience <clears throat> and expertise. <clears throat> So yeah, so to help you know organizations that are uh, funding projects uh, like state departments of natural resources or federal agencies like the EPA or U.S. Forest Service or BLM, where I'm at, but you know in other countries as well, helps to identify people who would have a you know this high standard that have met this high standard of SER. Like it helps stri streamline bidder selection process by you know weeding. Some people out potentially, or at least giving them additional points for having certification. And by connecting it to the SCR standards, you can set, you know, it's a higher standard of work again, rather than just sort of, um, you know, putting project in the ground quickly and constructing it, not thinking about pre planning or post monitoring and follow up. It sets a higher standard for the work we're doing on restoration. One of the things that I hadn't thought about as much before I was involved with the program is that um, it benefits the academic institutions in a lot of ways too. We have this alignment process. So I've worked with a number of universities to look at their uh, coursework and it helps them to tailor it or just make sure they have the classes available that you need to get the certification uh, to be aligned with the SERP and SERPIT. So, if they've gone through that, then they can tell their students, well, look, if you just do all these classes, then you'd be set to get the, the serpent training, the serpent. So we've done this with, um, there's actually more than this now, with the universities um, from around the world, actually. Most are in the US, but uh, University of Victoria is in Canada. This UNL is in Mexico, Niagara's in Canada. So mostly in uh, North America, um, but it, it applies all over. You know, I spoke to a university in India a few weeks ago, and they're interested in having their students apply for it. So we'll probably get a lot more from India now. Yeah, and then the, uh, so we have this whole continuing education program now, and it's helped people in that. We've worked with a lot of these groups in one way or another to either, you know, uh, improve their webinars and short courses for uh, CECs, continuing education credits, uh, and vice versa. So then we'll have webinars that they'll approve for their CEC programs. And this has really grown so much in the last couple of years. I mean, with the COVID, of course, and everybody's sitting at home looking at their computer most of the day. So that there's this, it's expanded uh, a lot um, in the last couple of years. All right, yeah, so I just, um, that's kind of the wrap up there on the, just, just talking about the benefits and more generally, but uh, overall, you know, so we've had about 520 people now. You can look up the people who have the certification on the SER website on this um, directory link here on the upper left, if you're interested. And we do have people from all over the world. It is concentrated in North America, but we have uh, South America, Number number of people from Europe, England, Italy, Australia, uh, a few in Africa. Um, less than, there's less in Asia, but we're kind of working to try to expand it in those areas. We do have some people in India now, and that seems to be potentially growing. I was just showing some of the countries where we have people in. I think there might be one or two more in there now. <clears throat> the most recent batch of SERPs. Yeah, now, now let's talk a little bit about some of these opportunities and challenges in North America. Well, there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, you know, restoration field has been growing like crazy for, well, I mean, the last 20 years or more. So there was kind of a, a pent up demand to have some kind of credentials. Uh, you know, there were similar things in other fields. And so there's a lot of people that, that want to do it, I think. Um, and there's just, um, there's also, you know, yeah, the increasing education opportunities online. Um, 
So we're you know, able to provide these online webinars, which help people with continuing education. But not just that, anybody who's interested in restoration or more practical restoration work, you know, you can learn so much online now. Uh, and we're hoping at, at some point to get, um, you know, more, we have one e-learning course right now for people doing the certification or anybody that's interested in it actually can view that on the SER website. Yeah, but we're hoping to have in the future more kind of online classes about restoration to make it more accessible, especially around, around the world, uh, places where there's not as many academic classes on ecological restoration. You know, so there's a lot of opportunity for it to grow. The challenge, you know, some of the challenges are just recognition by institutions. Uh, people know um, SER pretty well, but most people don't know about SERP around the whole, you know, North America or the world. And so just getting institutions, you know, that do the restoration work, especially to recognize the SERP and the value of it. So like the, in the U.S., you know, places like the, you know, EPA or Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management that are doing restoration work and hiring people and we are working with some of those people, We're working with the Park Service and BLM on different training courses and related projects now. Um, so, you know, we want to try to get CERP uh, certification recognized in proposals more often so that it'll give advantage to people doing that. Um, you know, who have the CERP, I'll give an advantage to those people, but also to improve you know, the quality of projects by asking for people who have more training to do the work. Yeah, and then, I mean, the other challenge is just having and sort of distinguishing it from other professions. Um, you know, right now, a lot, uh, you get a lot of work, especially in wetlands, well, especially in stream restoration that's done by uh, engineers. Uh, and then there's, you know, landscape architects. There's also other certifications, which are probably, you know, they're, I mean, and they're all complementary in a way. I mean, you work together in a lot of these projects and interdisciplinary teams, right? It's not just, you know, one person. But in terms of um, growing the, the SERP, it's important to, you know, distinguish it from other fields and describe the, the values and expertise that restorationists have specifically that others don't as much. <laughs> and oftentimes, you know, in comparing it to the more kind of physical sciences, you have a lot of people who are more knowledgeable about plant, you know, plant ecology, plant installation, invasive species control, you know, seed mix, uh, developing seed mixes, installing them, and management over time, those kind of things. <clears throat> and the SERP has been growing into developing countries more. I give the India example here just because we've been talking to them, uh, a couple of people over there more. We have um, one of our board members from SCR is from India and he's connected us over there with uh, the university I mentioned. And we've had a couple applicants from there recently. So that, you know, India has a lot of, of well-trained scientists uh, and people interested in ecological restoration. I mean, they produce, yeah, just, a, I mean, a ton of people with PhDs and, and a lot of good training. And, and there's a lot of interest in restoration, doing restoration work and a need to, to address land degradation, um, I mean, and as well on the opposite end, things that are more, um, have more biodiversity value, um, like the tiger habitat and things in, in parts of India. The challenges can be, you know, a different um, languages. Um, and also, yeah, so lack of classes in restoration and natural resources management, but especially specifically the ones in ecological restoration. Um, and uh, I'll talk about this later, but in the requirements for the certification, we do have a, a clause in there that allows you to uh, replace, essentially use your work experience or knowledge obtained through webinars, short courses, et cetera, in place of formal education. So that allows people um, who aren't, you know, just who don't have access to that formal education in specific classes to still get certification. Um, the other, you know, one of the other barriers is just the, credit systems and the hours are so different all over the world. You know, it's kind of like, uh, even in Canada, the credit system is quite different than the US and then you start going to other parts of the world. That's a little bit of a challenge. It's not a, anything that would slow you down in the long term. You just gotta figure out how they convert. 
but it is a question a lot of people have when they're applying. <clears throat> All right, so that, that was kind of the end of the part here on the, on the big picture. And uh, then I'll, I'll run through the application process uh, and show some examples of people who have it and then take time for questions. Mm -hmm. So we have these um, focused periods of review um, when the applications are reviewed by our committee. You can apply anytime. So if you're interested, I encourage you to get started on it because um, there are a number of steps to it. You can't do it you know, in one night. It, it takes you a number of hours to get um, reference letters, you know, to project examples and all the parts to it. And so I'll go through some of those requirements here. So first of all, yeah, you have to take this e-learning course. And this is a short online video that SCR staff developed talking about some of the background and history of uh, SCR's work in policy and um, kind of restoration guidance documents. And it's not intended to be a course on the whole field of ecological restoration, but just to get you familiar with the kind of terminology and framework that SCR is working from to um, yeah, prepare you to you know, read through and understand the, the standards and principles documents, and then use that to relate to your projects, um, both for the application, but also in a future work, just uh, understanding those principles and standards and trying to, you know, trying harder to, to build that into your projects, kind of bigger, more holistic kind of life cycle of uh, restoration projects. It takes a couple hours to go through it all. We actually just created a new website um, on there. So if you if you go to the certification site in uh, SER and click on it, you can find you can find the e-learning course. You don't actually have to apply. You can view that e-learning course even if you're not applying. This is the application uh, scale here for the SERP. It's 250 if you're a member. 350 if you're not. For the serpent trainings, it's 100 or 200 if you're not. And I should say right off the bat that we have variable rates. We have uh, this policy called um, well equity rates and open open doors. So we can adjust the rates, uh, you know, according to ability to pay. Essentially, <clears throat> that way we're not really, you know, we we hope we don't exclude anybody from doing it. <clears throat> These are just different steps of the application process. Um, so there's a knowledge base. We have to have certain coursework. So I'll show here in a minute. Um, professional experience, project experience, implementing the projects. Um, and by professional level, um, what we mean is that you're some way guiding, designing, or planning the projects, that you're not just doing um, only the manual labor. The on the ground work is of course part of the project, but if you're not um, using your education or experience in some way to, to direct or guide the project, then it doesn't count as professional, professional level experience. And then we need three letters of reference and you sign an ethics and disciplinary policy. You don't need the project level experience for the SERP it, SERP and training. All right. And just kind of an overview of the knowledge requirements. Uh, so you need coursework in ecological restoration, two classes, and the quantitative science of so things like math and statistics, or um, you know using GIS for quantitative analysis. Resource management and conservation. These would be things like conservation, biology, uh, forestry or fisheries management, physical science, things like chemistry, physics, Geomorphology, soils, hydrology, and biology uh, includes things like ecology and botany and zoology. All right, and then this kind of lays it out more specifically, the kind of classes you need on those major categories, which I mentioned. You also need six specifically in soils, hydrology, and or climate science. <clears throat> uh, and then you also need, there's some subcategories of resource management and conservation and quantitative science. <clears throat> All right, uh, so yeah, so that is a, a kind of a long list of course that might be look a little less, a little daunting. Um, most of the people doing 
restoration or natural resources management programs now, they, they have all those, they're getting all those classes. But people in the past, I know when I went to school, they didn't have specific classes in ecological restoration, at least in undergrad. I, and when I was in grad school, they did. But the point is a lot of people um, might not have all that coursework. And so you can use uh, prior work experience and knowledge gained by other means, like webinars, short courses, um, things like that. You can use those in place of formal classwork, this thing called PLAR. <laughs> all right, this is the acronym. Um, so that enables uh, us to kind of broaden out um, a definition of, um, you know, knowledge to include these other forms of learning. All right, so that allows people who, for whatever reason, were not able to access those kind of courses to still uh, get the certification. But, you know, you still need to have the, the work experience. Um, I mean, ultimately, you're trying to, you know, um, get people who are doing really good work. And so, you know, if you say so if you've been doing, you know, restoration work for 10, 15 years, and then you don't meet all the courses, you can use the PLAR, and then you'll still get the certification. The idea that you would have gained that similar knowledge by on the job learning about, you know, using doing applied ecology, vegetation management, and those kind of things. Uh, <clears throat> all right, yeah, and this is just a little detail on some of the uh, professional level experience required. I'll say about this is that, so we asked for five years full-time experience. Um, oftentimes people's jobs are not 100% restoration. I know some of the jobs I had in the past, uh, you know, my, like say like you're a water resources scientist specialist and my, you know, my job was maybe 25% restoration. So, I mean, in that case, then you need, you know, more, more years. Uh, so you just have to describe the percent of your job that's on restoration when you apply. <laughs> All right, then you have to describe three projects that you've worked on and how it relates to these, you know, these good restoration practices, which are, you know, exemplified in the standards and principles for restoration that SCR has. <clears throat> uh, so I point out here too on the bottom that experience can include um, kind of all phases of the project life cycle, project design, implementing it or actually doing it, monitoring, following up, and our oversight. So we have people who are more like program managers for government programs, putting, you know, funding restoration work. Um, so that experience accounts too. It's not just the on the ground doing it. Uh, all those things are critical to getting restoration work done and you're involved in meetings and planning of the projects. So all those things count toward experience to varying degrees. <clears throat> All right, yeah, and then you need uh, three letters of reference. Uh, in the future, we're gonna start requiring that people have letters from certified practitioners or SERPs. I'm not doing that yet. <clears throat> you also sign this ethics code uh, to you know, ensure that people are aware of and following kind of a high standard of, contact, of conduct and um, trying to do good work and, you know, uh, adhering to the standards. All right, so you sign that, and that rarely comes up. Um, occasionally it has, but very rarely in terms of the disciplinary parts of it, uh, that is. <clears throat> All right, so then you get your application in, and we do have independent reviewers who, uh, people who have the certification already are the reviewers. <clears throat> so um, send it in, these people review it. And then we get back to you with a you know, decision about whether you, you know, met the criteria or whether uh, sometimes people will apply for the SERP and they don't have quite enough experience and they end up with a SERP bit. <clears throat> There's some of the uh, hurdles <clears throat> helping you get over those. So it does take, yeah, um, an evening or two because you have to go through steps um, uploading your college transcripts, coursework. It can be unofficial. Uh, <clears throat> what else is there? Um, the cost, like I mentioned, we have these uh, um, this open door policy so that we can adjust rates for people who aren't as able to pay for the whole amount. 
And we can help you with all this too, if you're applying, of course, um, <clears throat> we can help you with all, all the steps along the way. Well, the last thing on here is about being afraid of rejection. Yeah, so only the committee sees these. Uh, it doesn't hurt to just apply. And if you do apply and you don't meet the SERP, you can get the SERP in training. And then that makes it much easier to actually get in to the SERP. Um, so yeah, so I definitely encourage people to try if they think they're on the, on the border or something. Um, you can either you know, ask me, email me, or um, just you know, apply and see what happens. <laughs> okay, uh, and the, the next focus window is starting February 15th, but we do uh, accept applications all the time now because it takes a little while to get them in. Oftentimes it's the reference letters that kind of drag on because you're you know, having to rely on other people. You can't um, write those yourself. <laughs> so there's various steps that sometimes take a little bit longer. So sometimes people will start a month or a couple of months ahead. All right, let's take a break for a few seconds here and then just, um, transition into some examples, of people who have the certification. <laughs> All right, so I'll give a few examples here from government consulting and academics, uh, kind of in order there. The Nick Wildman is from Massachusetts uh, State Government Office that does restoration work. And then Paul Davis is a um, involved in the, in the committees of certification with us, and he's a consultant. And then Mark Nason is a academic from England. Yeah, so Nick Wildman, he did, he did a webinar on dam removal in December on SER. He's been involved in a variety of different stream river restoration projects, especially dam removal. They're taking out a lot of small dams in Massachusetts. Uh, yeah, and he applied to be, you know, I think more involved in restoration world. And not all of his job would be restoration, but most of it in his case. Um, but give him, you know, connections to this broader sort of network of people doing similar work where you can learn and connect and network and things. Uh, similarly, this is with uh, Paul Davis. Um, he has a PhD in aquatic ecology and has worked with uh, G GZA for. A number of years, the last 13, 14, 15 years, I think now. <clears throat> all right, yeah, and so um, he does a number of different things. Again, not all restoration work, but he likes kind of the restoration work the most. It's kind of the best type of work that he does, and it's critical to our collective future, as he says there. <clears throat> and he talks about, you know, some of the type of work he does as a consultant, both in the, in the public and private sectors, and projects where restoration is a primary objective, uh, where the first goal is to restore an ecosystem or secondary, which is often the case with mitigation where you have, say, impacts of a road on wetlands and you're replacing the wetlands because the impacts uh, to follow the laws, but the mitigation or, or restoration was a secondary goal. Uh, that's a lot of what people do, especially in, in consulting work, it seems. <clears throat> He's worked on a variety of things, the dam removal, uh, bog restoration, creek restoration, and upland restoration or terrestrial restoration. I just I have a couple examples of projects. Um, so then the stage dam removal. Um, and dam removal in general is a type of project where you really want credential people, you know, of engineers, you'd probably have a team of engineers, architects, and restorationists, um, and probably geomorphologists working together. And the reason being is because a lot of these old dams, while well, they can be safety hazards, they're just filled up with sediment behind them actually from accumulating sediment over a century or more. So there's this risk of release and, you know, uh, impacts on the stream, uh, downstream of where you would remove the dam. So they do this stage thing, the stage process where they knock parts of it back a little bit and let the sediment kind of stabilize and revegetate before they knock the dam out. Uh, okay, it's a good example of a, a project where you really want somebody with experience and a SERP in this case would help, you know, demonstrate his experience and credentials and doing these kind of complicated projects that might have negative, uh, potential negative impacts on other parts of the environment. Uh, and uh, a lot more uh, 
a typical project is shown here where you're, you know, it's kind of a, a a natural landscaping project on the coast of the east coast of the USA, where they're combining erosion control, trying to stabilize these dunes um, while using native plants and doing native plant restoration, and also protecting infrastructure behind it, the roads, um, while at the same time also providing some you know, recreational activities for people able to walk on this boardwalk. Kind of a multi disciplinary multi-purpose project. Um, that's typical, a lot of restoration work. Uh, and he is, used the standards and tried to incorporate them in many of these projects. Um, it's not, a, you're not always able to do all those uh, parts of the standards, but you know, you can at least um, use, use uh, some of them to do, try to do better work. Uh, all right, and he, his, uh, Reasons for applying for the for the CERP credentials was, uh, yeah, just demonstrating his knowledge and experience, you know, and that he cares about the work he does uh, by signing the ethical statement, agreeing to that. That you know, you're not just trying to do the cheapest work, but you know, trying to elevate the quality of the work you and your firm are doing. All right, and uh, yeah, and then also increasing your odds of winning proposals by um, having his CERP credentials. And he gave some advice for the applications is that it take time to fill out the application. It takes, takes a while to get in all the steps uh, in there, uh, describing your projects, getting your reference letters, et cetera. So it can make it easier if you spend a little time up front doing a good job on this, on the writing part of it. <clears throat> and then, yeah, he mentioned, as he said, you can use this PLAR. If you don't have all those uh, courses, you can, Think about your experience and how you would have learned about restoration or natural resources management in your job or in webinars or other ways you would have gained knowledge and, and use that to help fill in the coursework that you don't have. <clears throat> All right, and then uh, yeah, another example here is uh, yeah, this Mark Nason's a professor at Cornwall College in England, U in the United Kingdom. He just applied recently. Um, he does a combination of research working with students, teaching classes, uh, and you know, involving restoration work in his um, teaching and research. Uh, this is a picture of the Eden Project in the southwestern part of England, where they're doing um, restoration work, um, as well as this is, there's some uh, kind of botanical, indoor botanical garden type of things there um, that help with the kind of outreach and learning part of it. <clears throat> But yeah, so the point of showing that was we have people in all kind of sectors, uh, private, you know, private, public, um, academics. All right. Let's, mm. And uh, actually, that's that's all I have for now. And uh, it take time for. Take time for questions. I think I went through that a little bit faster than I thought it would. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Chris. That was a very clear explanation of the why and how to participate in the certification program. I'm going to move over into the Q&A right now. For participants, please type your questions in and I'm going to not ask them in order, but rather try to clump them in certain themes. And I'm gonna start with the more general questions and then I'll move to more specific questions about the certification process. Um, okay, so just first, there was one question that came in about the availability of documents in languages other than English. Yeah, so that's that's a good a good question, and I I believe the standards and principles have been translated in some languages. Um, I and I don't know. I should know the exact answer to that, but I don't. Uh, I can look into that. I know that they have done. Yes, yeah, there has been some work on that. So I could yeah, I could look into that and give you a better better answer. But yeah, there, there's a little work on that. We didn't. We need to do more more work on that. Okay, fantastic. There's a couple mm -hmm. of questions here um, that show that people 
um, were a little confused about whether academic projects could count or what, and then in some cases, whether company projects could count. So could you just speak in general about the project experience needed? Yeah, so we, you know, we, you can count experience from kind of all angles of the project, you know, life cycle. So, you know, we, you can include, that includes um, research and monitoring of projects. If you're directly involved in, in field work, um, you do, you know, you do have to describe um, three projects that you were involved in and how um, they relate to the, the principles and standards. Um, so while you can, you know, in, include research and monitoring things, you do have to, you know, at least be at some level involved in the um, doing or planning of the of the project. You and it's, but in terms of company projects, and it, you know, there's a lot of, yeah, private consulting work. I mean, that's probably most of, much of it or most of it, if not that um, people do that are you know doing the certification. Probably most of the people are in consulting. I think that's the biggest group we have. So that, I mean, that definitely counts. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. There is a question about um, who is, the question was actually based in the US, but I'll, I'll frame it more generally. Uh, one of the advantages of certification, if, if you are certified, is that you might be potentially prioritized for jobs uh, based on the certification. And the question was about which state and federal agencies in the US are thinking of requiring a SERP sign off on projects. Um, but I'll just expand that to globally. Yeah, so I mean, um, yeah, a lot of, I mean, proposals often will ask for certain but you know, experience uh, or, or ways of demonstrating that. And while right now there's not a lot of proposals specifying SERP because they don't know about it yet, um, it still helps. Um, you know, in the past I had um, the um, professional wetland scientist designation, the PWS, um, and that helped me in certain projects, especially in like wetland delineation things. Um, but with the SERP, yeah, I think I mean it does it does help because they often ask for specific lists of experience or you know expertise, and this ties it to uh, you know SER and the standards that you've been certified by this organization. Uh, yeah, so does that answer your question? I don't know if there's more. I mean, um, on that you no. could probably say, but. I think that was a good answer and I'm going to indulge myself in sort of adding a little bit too, in that this is a relatively new program and we have seen certifications in other fields really improve the quality of practice for a certification restoration to have the same effect. Clearly, we need to grow in terms of numbers. And so this is an opportunity for everyone in the field who believes that we need to improve the quality of practice to join in and help in that effort. Because as it expands and as it expands globally, um, we could see the number of agencies, entities, et cetera, who um, require additional, um, who require a certification or at least consider who they're hiring and whether or not they are aware of the foundations and standards of practice in the field. So we can all be part of growing the certification program. And I'm gonna just yeah. indulge myself, I'm so sorry, a minute more to say that the standards that were developed by uh, the Society for Ecological Restoration had a very large number of co-authors from around the globe based on two years of consultation and they're viewed as a living document. So one of the problems with standards is that they can inhibit innovation in the field. The idea with these standards is that there will be opportunities for future global consultation so that um, we can maximize the benefits of standards and of certification and minimize that downside of reducing innovation and growth. Okay, that's it for me. Let's go, any comment on that? Okay, great. Um, let's see. So 
Um, here's two uh, questions about qualifications. Um, have you seen SERP listed in job description preferred qualifications yet? Can you expand on the value of the program to nonprofits, governments, or other non-private business organizations and individuals? I think we talked about that in, in terms of you know, who's looking for it. Um, so let's move on to this other uh, question, which is about quality. The term quality is being used quite a bit. How do you define quality in terms of a restoration project? Oh, yeah, right. Well, um, so, and that's where I uh, didn't so much on the standards and, and principles. There's a kind of a whole other PowerPoint <laughs> presentation on, on that. But in there, there's, um, you know, principles um, describing, you know, what goes into a good project. And I mean, it, you know, so, and those are things like, um, you know, doing planning beforehand, uh, you know, considering the external, you know, kind of surrounding settings, the landscape setting and not just the site itself. Um, you know, you um, connecting it, connecting the restoration project to like a, a reference goal or model, you know, and using a um, that to guide your restoration. And then, you know, using that to establish or improve a performance of an, you know, native ecosystem, a functioning ecosystem. And so I said, yeah, these projects that are, Going through the all the, the kind of stages of the project cycle from planning, doing it, and then following up, you know, where you're monitoring and having a maintenance plan or management plan. I mean, one of the biggest problems with restoration is that uh, people will put in projects, plant all these plants, and then, you know, uh, two years later, it's covered by invasive species. Um, so a big part of it is following up and having um, a plan, and that's I think one of the strengths of the standards and principles is that it, it gives a framework and encourages people to build that long-term thinking into the project planning before you do it in the first place. Because um, yeah, a lot of projects look good, you know, on day one or day, you know, 300, <laughs> but what about, you know, what about five, 10 years later? Uh, did I get all that? Was there another part there about the quality? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think you um, addressed that. There's a, a few questions about um, the, what if I have the field experience, but not the academic training or vice versa. But as part of that, um, there was a question that came in about the name SERPIT. And I'll just read this question. Has there been thought to create an alternative certification class for field practitioners without strong academic backgrounds? as in training isn't an appropriate designation for these types of experienced professionals. So could you talk about, uh, just again, mention the in training designation um, and yeah. how that works and then talk about the title. Well, yeah, so the SERP in training originally was meant um, for st students uh, who hadn't had work experience yet. And so there's, that's why it's called in training but since we've been doing it, it's kind of widened out, really. It's people who are recent graduates or people who changed careers, you know, and haven't, you know, had five years of experience yet. And we've actually been talking about changing the name of that because I think it makes it sound like the people <laughs> don't have any experience or something. Um, so we've been talking about actually changing the name of that, but but it includes a broad, yeah, kind of range of people. And um, but it's mostly, yeah, if you have the education um, but not the experience. And then, uh, um, sorry, what's the other part of that? Um, yeah, oh, you're asking about the creating a, a level or a kind of a certificate for people with technical experience with, without the coursework and things. Um, yeah, and so we actually, there has been some di oh. discussion of that. Yeah, I know um, Bethany Walder is an executive director, SCR has been working with this group in California actually to create a certificate for contractors and installers of restoration projects. Um, so there's that um, kind of initiative at just kind of, uh, that's in California actually. But yeah, there has been interest in what exactly what you're talking about. We don't have that yet, um, but that, that would be a good idea. I mean, and, and you know, it's just, um, it hasn't been done yet. 
Mm -hmm. so, um, there were, were a few interesting suggestions like for regional certification schemes. And then the uh, very first uh, question that came in was a comment. It'd be great to also have a certification for donor organizations to certify that what they invest in is good practice so we can avoid things like money given for planting eucalyptus and grasslands. Could you speak a little bit about what kinds of changes we might see, which you mentioned, um, you know, a few related to in training, but also the process that the certification program will be using to evaluate how it's working and make changes moving into the future. Oh, well, so you're, what's for projects, like certifying how projects are working potentially, um, or yeah, so I mean, and I mean, so the standards, you know, the standards of principles, there is this, um, you know, five star system where you can kind of describe or characterize project as being from just sort of minimizing, you know, degradation or human impact all the way to like a fully restoring a fully functioning ecosystem that's con connected to the landscape has a lot of biodiversity. Um, and so anyway, there's been some discussion of um, trying to work with organizations, um, especially it's come up with wetland mitigation banking to tie the standards in to those. So like um, a state wetland bank could kind of certif certify that their project is following the standards and then use it to assess it, um, you know, using this five-star um, system. And the, there's this thing called the recovery wheel where you kind of rank or kind of assess the improvement of the project before and after and over time. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of interest in using that, I think. And, you know, there's, I think, a kind of a, hist a record of other, other professions where they, uh, you know, have done this kind of thing where I'm thinking of the, the LEED, I think it's called, where they certify buildings as being like a sustainable building that are minimizing energy use and using sustainable materials and stuff. But yeah, you, I mean, you could do the same thing with restoration projects if people were interested in that. And I think people at SER are interested in that. Um, it just it really haven't, um, opportunities haven't quite uh, come up yet exactly, or people haven't figured out how to do that. It's all kind of new, all the stuff's still, still relatively new, like Kara was pointing out, all this just started a few years ago. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Now, now we have a, a very specific question. Uh, what do we mean by annual maintenance fee? Oh. Yeah, so once you get the certification, um, there's an annual fee to keep it. And it's what I believe $75 if you're a member or 50 for the SERPIT. And that can be, again, a, a modified for the, the open doors policy. That's to help pay for this, the ongoing program, you know, work and providing continuing education and things. ESCR is it. You know, it's a not-for-profit organization, but we need some money to keep the things going. So it's that's that's what it's for. It's just going to you know keep the program going, help support the serp and serpents um, with CEC and other things that that are done, providing webinars and things like that. Yeah, great. Thanks. And I'll add on to that that when the society was evaluating whether or not to create the program, we learned that running certification programs is not a money-making endeavor, but actually um, requires finding financial support in, in order to run the program. And so that's that annual maintenance fee. It just allows the program to keep going. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're closing in on our hour here, and I want to end on a question um, that's a really big picture question. What's the role of certification in valuation and conservation of biodiversity and ecosystem services? So it gives you a chance to kind of talk about the importance globally. All right. So the role of certification in those things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a really good question. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, um, yeah. So I think connecting to the standards um, and expanding those over time, I mean, part of, Part of it, like with the you know recovery wheel, is calibrating that toward different environments, um, different ecosystems. So, like here, we've been working on some climate change mitigation or adaptation projects, um, 
with peatland restoration. Um, and so I think, you know, in those kind of projects, it's important to um, be able to, you know, guarantee or at least increase the probability that you're doing restoration in such a way that you're actually going to achieve the goals. I mean, the carbon, you know, carbon cycle was, um, I don't know, you know, a complex thing. Um, as are, I mean, a lot of ecosystem restoration projects. And, uh, you know, I think, um, like I said, it's easy to kind of throw something in the ground and have it look good in day one. But over time, you know, whether those things are working or not, it can be um, trickier. And so, you know, you need people who are trained and have experience to make sure that those projects are working and you're not just wasting your money. Um, and it does happen sometimes, you know, that, that you, you'll do these projects and it seems like it worked, but over time it might not actually, um, so say with the carbon sequestration projects, you do it in such a way that it actually becomes a source of carbon, you know, rather than a, a sink. And that would be a big problem. <laughs> and so they, I think things where you, you have this, the standards, um, you're just trying to um, raise the bar so people are, are following some principles and trying to do the best job they can and, and tying that to a way that it can be sort of universally applied. Um, you know, as Kara mentioned, the principles and standards was written by people from all over the world and done over many years. And so it, it is able to be applied in different environments around the world um, with some work to kind of tweak it toward the local environment, but. Great. Thank yeah. you so much, Chris. We really yeah. appreciate your time in joining us today and explaining the certification program. Mm. Chris's email address is posted on the SER website. That's www.ser.org. Um, if you scroll through the chat, you'll see those links. We also put chats into the standards on uh, ecological restoration, as well as recently released standards on nature-based solutions. I do want to plug next month's mm -hmm. webinar, which is application of earth observations for ecosystem restoration. And Brock Blevins, the co-chair of the thematic group, will be presenting in his capacity as a training lead for NASA. And this is going to be a great way to catch up on the remote sensing tools that we can use to design and monitor ecosystem restoration activities. I also want to put a plug in for membership in IUCN CEM. For those of you who are not currently members, please reach out to Brock at, or me and we can get you information and explain a little bit more and point you to websites. I did post the website with the link to videos. And then um, finally, for those of you who are members of the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group, you may recall that IUCN operates on a four-year schedule. Brock and I will be working this year to put together our work plan and objectives for the next four years. One of the things we've discussed is providing more opportunities for members in the thematic group to provide input and comment on documents. Um, and given the UN decade on ecosystem restoration and the fact that it's getting organized this year, we will be having a lot more calls out to all of you for participation, um, both in substantive work on initiatives and restoration, but also in helping to develop the work plan for the thematic group. So that's it for this month. Hopefully we'll see you next month. Happy New Year. And Chris, thanks again so much for sharing your time with us. Bye-bye, yeah, everybody. thanks for having me. <clears throat> All right. Thanks. Yeah.